Welcome to my second video about deep policy search. In this class, I will cover the difference between direct policy search and policy gradient methods. So first, let's define again what's policy search. F take for instance this robot whose goal is to collect some tennis balls over time. We want this robot to collect as many balls as possible given some time limit for instance. So, so as to define the mathematical tools that we need, we first have to define the controller of this robot and we will take some parametric policy. So we call it P of theta and theta is a set of parameters. For instance, it can be the weights of a neural network. Okay. And the robot or the agent will be driven this by this par particular controller or policy. We will call tau uh, trajectory of the agent and we call r of tau the corresponding return. So for instance, if this robot is performing a particular trajectory, then probably it can collect a particular uh, number of balls corresponding to the return uh, of the agent in the, uh, over this particular trajectory. So what we want to do is to optimize some global function that we will call j of theta and this j of theta is the expectation for all the trajectories generated with the particular uh, poly parameterized policy. So the expectation over this trajectory of the return of the corresponding trajectories. The point is that we cannot get this expectation directly, so we have to sample the expectation using as many trajectories as possible. And the goal will be to find the optimal set of policy parameters, so theta star, which corresponds to the maximum of g of theta uh, over the possible theta. And uh, g of theta can be rewritten if we want to replace the expectation by a set of trajectory, by the sum over the trajectories of the probability of a particular trajectory given the policy parameters theta times the return of the corresponding trajectory. That's the definition of this expectation once we sample it. For instance, if you want to know more about policy search method, you should read this very nice survey from Mark Dieselnot and, and colleagues. Now that we have, to, we have defined uh, policy search, we can say that one way to solve the optimization problem corresponding to finding the optimum of g of theta would be to perform gradient descent on theta. So we would take the derivative of g of theta with respect to theta and find the optimum. Okay. But the point is that the performance function g of theta is unknown as well as its gradient. The only way to get some information about g of theta is to choose a theta to generate trajectories with this theta and get the corresponding theta return. So we can get some points of g of theta just by sampling different thetas, but we don't have access to the an analytical function in g of theta. That would be very, very complicated to, guess the, to get this analytical uh, function, for instance, in the case of the robot collecting balls. So once we have found the uh, approximate value of a particular theta, we can look for a better theta. And that's what we will do in the next uh, methods. So I will cover two different uh, families of methods. The first is direct policy search. And in direct policy search, I will cover truly random search, population-based methods like genetic algorithms or evolutionary methods, evolutionary strategies or evolution strategies, estimation of distribution algorithms like CM, uh, cross-entropy methods and CMAES, and finite differences. Actually, I won't cover those two, but I will give you references to no more about them. And then in the second part, I will go to policy gradient methods. If you want to know more about these methods, you could read this paper where I am giving an overview of uh, these methods um, in comparison to deep reinforcement learning methods. So what's truly random search? Okay, first I call it truly random search because there is a family of methods that are closely related to evolution strategies that are called random search, but in fact they are not random at all. They are using some uh, gradient information 
indirect uh, gradient information. So what's truly random search? You take a theta randomly, then you perform a set of trajectories and you get the, your, the return. If the return is the best so far, you keep this theta, okay, and you loop until you find a good enough uh, g of theta, and you just keep th the best theta so far. Of course, this method is not efficient because if the space of theta is very large, you may take a very, very long time before you find a, very, a good enough uh, theta. But it's completely blind, so it's very general. You don't have any assumption on the about the function g of theta. So that's the best you can do if you don't have any such assumption. In all the methods that we will see uh, next, we are assuming that two Uh, close theta have a close uh, performance and th this is just by moving from theta to th other thetas in the neighborhood that we hope to find a better uh, performance around. So <coughs> that's the case for instance of population based methods so that genetic algorithms and evolutionary methods in general. So the general Um, scheme of these methods consists in having a set of individuals. We evaluate these individuals, you, we select the best ones, eventually we uh, recombine those individuals so as to generate new individuals starting from the best ones. Eventually we mutate them, we don't just uh, recombine them, we also mutate them so we change some parameters in these individuals and this or this can be skipped and then we'll generate a new generation from the offspring of those individuals we evaluate them again and we select the best and so on and so on and this will converge slowly to some optimum which is in general a, a local optimum but these methods are quite efficient okay uh, and Here we have a few assumptions. Okay, I, I didn't say that in genetic algorithms, that's not directly individuals that you cross over and mutate. In fact, you have some genotypes and you have a function to transform a genotype into an individual. And that's through the genotypes that you are performing crossover and mutations. So th in these algorithms, there are two uh, implicit assumptions. The first one is that two close genotype, genotypes will give rise to two close phenotypes or two close individuals and that two close individuals have a close performance. That's the assumption that I told you about before. If you want to know more you can read the classical book from David Goldberg for instance. Um, I am skipping the evolution strategies to go straight to the crossotropy method and the CMA-ES, so ES for evolution strategies methods, we are a, which are a particular case of evolution strategies where the population is not represented as a set of individuals but as some model which is generally a Gaussian, so, uh, uh, a, Gaussian, so uh, a distribution of, uh, of individuals which is represented analytically. So, <coughs> for instance, with the cross-entropy method, we start with a particular distribution with some center and some variance. We draw some individuals corresponding to this distribution. We evaluate the corresponding individuals and we just keep the best ones. So, for instance, the one that have a gray, uh, a gray cir circle around them. Here, the, the goal is to go there where the, where the reward is the highest. Okay. And then we will generate a new distribution corresponding to these new individuals. Th that would be the ellipsoid here, or this one, depending on which algorithm you are using. And then from this new ellipsoid, you draw a new population, you evaluate them, you keep the best ones, and so on and so on. And you will see that this population will drift slowly towards uh, the uh, highest return that you can get. And uh, you will see in our paper with Frick Stulp about uh, cross-entropy methods and uh, CMAS that in fact those methods are very similar. The only thing that uh, changes is the way they select individuals for the next population. In CMAS the individuals are weighted according to their rank whereas in cross-entropy method you just keep them uh, with a um, the same value and you just take the average uh, over them. Uh, and okay, 
let's say that it's now well known in the reinforcement learning community that these methods, which are not reinforcement learning methods per se, are surprisingly efficient despite their simplicity. You can see more about these simple methods with this video, which is one of the deep RL bootcamp videos that I told you about in the introductions. In the introduction, sorry. So I have not covered plane evolution strategies. I have not covered infinite difference methods. Uh, I have not covered either some novelty search methods and Bayesian reinforcement learning. Okay, uh, but I have given to you an idea of how you can perform direct policy search without computing uh, the performance of being in a particular state and doing a particular action. So what is important is that all these methods are based on trajectories. They don't know about the um, individual steps during in the trajectory. You just get a return for performing a particular trajectory. And they follow a gradient of performance without explicitly computing this gradient which is the main difference between the methods that we will see in the second part of this class. After direct policy search methods, let's now have a look at policy gradient methods. As we have seen, the direct policy search approach consists in directly looking for a theta with the highest return. So with samples, we sample values of theta, we get the return and we look for the best. The alternat alternative idea is more complicated. It consists in increasing the probabilities of trajectories with a high return. That's the idea of the reinforced algorithm, which is published in this very classical paper from uh, Ronald Williams. And as we will see, this approach is not black box anymore. The idea is that to compute these probabilities and increase them, we access the states and actions visited during each episode, as well as the immediate rewards at each step. So we use more information from a trajectory than before. But we still don't know the transition and reward functions. Okay, We don't have access to the gradient of the performance of a particular theta directly. So that's a gray box approach. And what is very striking with these methods is that we will be able to use explicit gradients despite the fact that we don't have access to uh, j of theta. We will see how to do this in the next slides. So in the next, let's say, five to six slides, I am just repeating what Peter Abil uh, explains in his DPRL uh, bootcamp video. That's the number. You have the link there. And the first derivation, the first step that I will explain to you is explained at 12 minutes in that particular video. Um, so as I told you, we want to find theta star, which is defined this way. And we want to use a gradient method to find this theta star. So first we want to write the gradient of g of theta with respect to particular theta. And I will note the gradient using the nabla symbol. So nabla of theta means the gradient of g of theta with respect to theta. So by definition, if this is the definition of g of theta, that's the definition of the gradient of uh, g of theta with respect to theta. As you probably know, the gradient of a sum is the sum of the gradients. So I'm just putting the gradient inside the sum. And now I am using a small trick to uh, express this thing a little differently. So first, I have a one coefficient here that I express as p of theta and the probability of, uh, of tau given theta divided by itself. Nothing changes. And I am reorganizing so that this moves here. Okay. And what's interesting is that um, this can be expressed as the gradient of theta of the log of p of theta because if you derive the log, you get the gradient divided by the function that you are the, uh, deriving. Okay, And here you can recognize that's the expectation, because here you have the probability. Uh, that's the formula of the expectation of the gradient over theta of the log of the probability of the trajectories times the return of the trajectory. So here we have just reorganized this expression into something different so as to get an expectation again. 
now what can we do? Uh, first, we, we need to approximate this expectation. So we will approximate it using trajectories. We will assume that we have m trajectories. And here I am still following the notations of Peter Beal. So I consider that I have m trajectories. I will take my uh, gradient or my expectation as the average over all the trajectories. So 1 over m uh, times the sum over the m trajectories of that particular expression where tau of a means the if trajectory if trajectory sorry the point is that i still cannot compute this gradient because as i said before uh, the probability uh, of a trajectory over theta or even the return of a trajectory cannot be computed that's a black box function i need to play that particular trajectory to see what's the return and, and okay and, and, and that's it so what can I do I will use a second step to re uh, formulate this as something for which I can compute a gradient and that that's the key trick so that's the second step uh, in fact I won't explain it to you because that's a complicated mathematical derivation but you, again you can find it on Peter Abel's video at the uh, minute 18 okay and we can show that this expression can be reformulated so the log of the probability of the trajectory can be re-expressed as the log gra gradient of the probability of taking an action given a state so this p of theta here is a stochastic policy so it tells you the probability of taking that particular action if you are in that particular state and what's interesting is that the policy structure p of theta is something that you know that something that you have written in your code so for, for instance it's a neural network and you can compute the gradient over the weights of a neural network so now this gradient here can be computed which makes a completely different story instead of trying thetas and looking for a better one by chance now we can compute the gradient of the performance over theta the problem with this uh, formula, which is the basic policy gradient formula, is that it still suffers from a large variance. So there will be a third step where we will introduce a baseline so as to reduce that variance. But first I want to illustrate how to compute uh, this policy gradient in a very simple example. So let's consider a practical implementation where the stochastic policy is represented as a Gaussian. So the probability of theta of taking an action given a state is represented at that particular Gaussian where sigma is a covariance matrix and mu is the center of the Gaussian. Okay. So if I take the log of... Uh, okay, what's interesting is that taking the log of a, a probability represented that, uh, like this, so that's technique the log of an exponential and the, as you know this... Um, uh, functions are eliminating each other so the log of this probability is just that particular function without the exponential anymore and when I derive this with respect to theta I, take this, I, I get this simple function where here f of theta is the function that you use for instance the neural network so you will get this times the gradient of the neural uh, network with respect to the weight so you will just have to backpropagate that particular function uh, through your neural network so as to get a policy gradient uh, method uh, given the return that you get uh, here at each state for performing a particular action. Okay. Also you have to note that in this particular derivation we considered a fixed variance, so a fixed covariance matrix. And if we want to also evolve the covariance matrix, so that so as to do something similar to what CMAS does, where the covariance matrix evolves through time, then we need a more complicated derivation because we will also have to derive with respect to sigma of theta, and this derivation will get more complicated. You can get more details about doing this without uh, considering uh, parametric uh, covariance matrix in this uh, video which is one of the Berkeley classes from Sergey Levin about uh, policy gradient methods. I also prepared the slides for the 
single, uh, so the one dimensional case, okay, where the policy that you want to figure out is just one dimensional, so you just have one action with one dimension. And in that particular case, the Gaussian can be written mo more simply, so the derivative also is simpler, and you just have to back propagate this. Um, I want to warn you that in uh, Sergey Levin's uh, video, there is a factor one half that is still there, which is probably wrong if I am right. Okay. So let's go to the third step. As I told you, we had this basic policy gradient method uh, formula. And uh, the point is that computing this uh, gradient from complete trajectory is not the best we can do. In fact, after, after a third deri mathematical derivation, which is explained at the 28th minute in Peter Peterbill's video, you can simplify this computation by taking into account the fact that uh, um, what happens at different time steps, in fact, what happens in the future depends on what you did before, but not the contrary. Okay, so you can simplify a little more. And in fact, by using this third trick, you can reformulate the return uh, over a trajectory as the expected return for doing uh, particular action in a particular state and then following the trajectory corresponding to the policy. And uh, if you watch the video, you will see that, in fact, this is the Q function that appears in standard reinforcement learning algorithms. Okay. So these uh, Q values can be estimating using rollouts from the current state. But if you do so, you still suffer from a large variance. Uh, but you don't need uh, to compute a critique. You can just use rollout and compute this formula in a more efficient way than computing this formula. But you just compute this from a set of trajectories, and you don't have to keep memory of anything from the previous iterations. So this is still a, a pure policy gradient method. Finally, if you want to um, get a smaller variance, what we, you will have to do is to add a baseline, and now we will move towards actor-critic methods. So, in fact, in the formula that we had before, we can subtract the baseline uh, that depends on the state without affecting the computation of the gradient. Okay, as you will see if you look in Peter Zabil videos at, at that particular minute, you can see that uh, um, the gradient is independent of uh, adding the space line. Okay, and uh, it was shown before that a particularly good baseline is using the value function of the current policy at the particular state. Okay, so if you do so, you can re-express the formula that we had before as the difference of the return from the current time state to the horizon that you get minus the baseline. And this will correspond to what is called an advantage function. So that's the difference between the Q function and the value function. <coughs> the point is that if you want to use this baseline, you have to estimate it for all states. And this particular structure is a critique that you keep from a, a set of trajectories to the next one. So it's not pure policy gradient method anymore. It's an actor critique because you have a critique that you want to keep along your iterations. And this, as I told you, this stuff is the advantage function. And using the advantage functions is a good idea because uh, you can show that by using this particular function, you can reduce the variance of your computation of the policy gradient. Uh, okay, so the general form of the policy gradient method with a baseline is this, so I have replaced this by the advantage function. Uh, and this is what we need to use when I will explain TRPO, PPO, etc. So if you want to know more about how to perform policy gradient methods with a baseline, the algorithm is given in Peter Abil's video at the 38th uh, minute. So to summarize, we have seen two kinds of methods, direct policy search and policy gradient. 
So direct policy search is optimization without a utility, without a model of the utility function. And we don't use any derivative, so it's gradient free or derivative free. The point with these methods is that they are, um, they do not reuse the samples uh, several times, so they have a low sample efficiency. That's explained in my survey with Rick Stulp about uh, policy search methods. Uh, you can get the reference of this paper again uh, in a few slides before this one. So that's direct policy search method. By contrast, policy gradient methods use an analytical derivative of the policy functions. And by doing so, they can get much more sample efficient because they can reuse the same samples several times to perform uh, steps of the gradient. So they also use information from each step and not just trajectories. And these particular policy gradient methods become actor critic when you, you, when you add a baseline, which is used to reduce the variance. So you need some critic that you keep from iteration to the next, and that this becomes actor critic methods. And after having seen this and these methods, we will be able to explain TRPO, PPO, and the like. That's the content of the next uh, classes. So if you have any question, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you again.